everyone, welcome back to my channel. If you're new here, my name is Chimmy. I make videos every week to add value to you as I do to myself. In today's video, I wanted to talk about sleep training and what I did to train Levi to sleep independently. I went all the way from nursing him to sleep and even rocking him and swinging him for each and every one of his naps and bedtime to now putting him wide awake in his cot and he sleeps independently. I've certainly not nailed it at all yet, but I've figured out what needs to be done. So I wanted to make this video to share my experience with you. In the beginning when I was trying to find out what to do, I found it really difficult because there was lack of information and there was conflicting information everywhere. Sleep training is always a controversial topic and I don't want to get into any of it. So let me lay out some disclaimers first and foremost. What I do is always with the best interest of my son Levi and my own family. And what suits my family may not necessarily suit your family or someone else. So take what you need um, because I'm only sharing my experience and what I've learned online and how I've adapted it to suit my lifestyle and my family's lifestyle. It could be beneficial to you or you could have different opinions but whatever it may be, I hope you find what you're looking for today. I'll be talking about how Levi's sleep was initially, how he sleeps at the moment, um, what I did differently, our routine and some tips and tricks that I've learned along the way. I have a feeling it's going to be a longish video so I'll leave timestamps in the description box below. You can and then click on whichever section that you want to look at. In the first couple of weeks or so of having Levi, a lot of people had advised us not to carry him so much, not to cuddle him too much and not to pamper him, especially when he's crying to sleep. But we did just that. Um, we realized that he really needed it because, you know, babies are in the womb for nine months. They are so comforted and they're warm all the time and they're cozy all the time. All of a sudden, once they're born, you can expect them to adapt to this world so quickly within a matter of days. It does take a few months for them to get used to it. That's why the first three months, the newborn stages after the baby is born, is known as a fourth trimester. Back in the days, there wasn't much research about the fourth trimester at all. So people always advised not to carry baby too much, otherwise they'll get used to it. There was a fear that you will instill bad behavior, that they won't be independent, they won't be able to sleep independently. So you shouldn't be carrying them too much and you know, let them do it. But that's not really how it works at all. We carried Levi to sleep right from day one. The day that Levi was born, I was in the hospital on my own and he was crying. He was actually fussing, he wasn't even crying, but back then I didn't know the difference between fussing and crying. So when he was fussing, I thought he was crying and I picked him up. I held him on me the whole night and I did not sleep at all so that he could sleep. Then when we got back home within the first week or so, we were trying to figure out breastfeeding and trying to understand what he needed and you know how to take care of him. So we didn't quite understand what was going on and we couldn't bear to see him cry basically. So we held him all the time. There were times where we had to take turns so that we could carry him and he can sleep while we stayed awake for him to sleep. One thing led to the other and we ended up swinging him and rocking him for every single nap and bedtime. We found out that if he was settled, he liked being rocked, he liked being held and cuddled. So that's what we did for the first three months. I've done a video, a vlog about how life is with a three month old and in that video I've explained how I put him to sleep for every single nap. I'll link that video up for you and you can have a watch at it if you wanted to. And the only other way that we could get him to sleep without swinging or rocking was nursing him. There were times where I was nursing him to sleep and I would be so quiet to put him down in his cot because if I did wake him up in the process of putting him down, we would end up having to rock him for 20 or 30 minutes or he would end up crying. So those were the two things that we had to do to put him to sleep for the first three months. At the time of filming this, Levi is now five months old. He sleeps independently for all of his naps and his bedtime. All I do is put him in his bed wide awake and he goes to sleep by himself. It feels a bit of a show off to actually say that, but you have no idea how I used to marvel when I heard people say that they are babies sleep independently. Everyone says, put the baby down drowsy and he falls asleep, or put the baby down wide awake and he falls asleep, and we couldn't figure it out for the first three months at all. Now that we are on this end where we are doing that, it feels really, really good to be able to say that. He wakes up for one feed at night, sometimes two. Even if he doesn't wake up, I wake him up to feed him. I wasn't looking to stop that night feed at all for him, so that was fine. Sometimes we do have our occasional outbreak and outburst, especially with night sleeps. Uh, we haven't had any problems with naps but only bedtime. 
like last week for example we had one whole week where he wouldn't go to sleep on his own he needed us to carry him we didn't have to rock him and swing him but he just needed us to comfort him so we did that for him he was teething and also mummy here made a mistake with his wake windows I'll explain what wake window is later on in a bit. So he was over tired by the time he went to bed and he couldn't settle at all. It's perfectly alright for him to have that, you know, occasional comforting that he needs. I wasn't looking for a permanent solution and there isn't a permanent solution for a baby especially. You cannot just train them once and say that's the end of it, that's it. They are sort of alike. Here's what we did and what prompted us to start thinking about sleep training. Fast forward to when Levi was about two and a half months old, I was diagnosed with deep Berman syndrome on my left wrist over here and that's what caused a lot of thoughts in me. My left wrist was completely out of action and I couldn't really rock him and swing him to sleep and that's when I started thinking this is not sustainable. I'm not able to do it for him. I can't continuously do this while he is putting on so much weight and he is thriving and growing and it's also not sustainable for him to be dependent on us to rock him and swing him to sleep. I always had the nursery at the back of my mind. When I go back to work at some point in the future, we would need to send him to the nursery no nurseries are going to rock your baby to sleep. We would do it at home because it's our baby but no one else is willing to do that. And I really didn't want any nurseries to let him cry on his own or you know, do some other method that he's not used to. I didn't want him to suffer through a lot of shocks at the same time because at the time that he'll be going to a nursery is when he will have the um, attachment issues and then you know, sleep problems as well. I just didn't want to pile that up on him at all. I spoke about the decrement syndrome in another vlog in detail. I'll link that up so that I don't repeat myself here in this one. So everything put together, we knew we had to sleep train him and I didn't want to do the cry out method at all. To be fair, that's the only method I had heard of until I started searching. When I started searching about sleep training, I came across several sleep training methods. It was the precious sleep training, taking Kara baby, Faber's method, um, respectful sleep training. These are only a drop in the ocean. There's so many more sleep training methods and there are so many sleep training consultants that you have to pay for. Because of our past experience with several things that we paid for, which wasn't even worth it at the end of the day, we really didn't want to pay for anything else. So we ended up reading a lot of books. Lakshman and I clubbed up reading a few books. So I read some and he read some. Um, once we had finished it, we gathered and we kind of discussed what we wanted to do. We didn't really want to follow one method per se. Like I said, I didn't want to do a cry it out method at all. And we were not very comfortable with a few other things. So we thought, okay, we're gonna try and do something. And then we came up with an action plan. First and foremost, we decided to change his daily pattern. We were doing the play, eat and sleep method. So meaning he's awake for a while and then he nurses and then he goes to sleep because I was nursing him to sleep, remember? That's a method I did. But we changed that to eat, play and sleep. So he has his milk first, he's awake for a while, he's able to digest and milk, he's full, he's able to bath, and then he goes to sleep. This way prevents babies from falling asleep right after nursing or even while nursing. And this is a first step to success with sleep training. This pattern is really, really important. The next thing is to watch his wake windows. Once he's had his milk, he needs to be awake for a certain period of time and then he goes to sleep. With newborn babies, they cannot be awake for a very long time at all. The first week of birth, I think they need to sleep about 20 hours um, a day and then, you know, it reduces over time. When I started sleep training Levi, he needed about 15 hours of sleep throughout the whole day so he could only be awake for 9 hours and he need to split it throughout the day. So his first wake window was one and a half hour so he could be awake for one and a half hour and then he would sleep for probably an hour, an hour and a half and then stay awake for one hour 45 minutes and then two hours. It was between a window of one and a half hour and two hours throughout the day. It's so important to follow this wake window. If you have too short a wake window your baby could be under tired so when you put them in their cot to sleep they're not going to fall asleep at all. They're wide awake in their cot and they'll be agitated because they're stuck in that. They can't do anything else and they're wide awake. If you stretch the wake window for way too long, they become overtired. With babies, when they're overtired, they just cannot fall asleep. I mean, we as adults experience that sometimes. If we are overtired, we just cannot 
fall asleep at all, but we have that pending sleep, you know. And if you're under tired and you get to bed, you still cannot fall asleep. You'll probably be scrolling on your phone or reading a book, but you're wide awake. While you're trying to figure out the wake window, it's important to look up for sleep cues as well. These sleep cues are quite obvious. The most obvious one is obviously the baby is yawning and then rubbing his eyes, scratching their ears, pulling their hair, not interested in whatever you are playing or entertaining them. You know, if you're reading a book or if you're talking to them, they don't want to look at you, they're not engaging face to face, they're not making eye contact, they're just looking away or looking in the distance. That clearly explains that they're already tired. They're no longer interested in whatever it is that is going on in front of them and they need to rest. This is what we follow for nap time. So he feeds first, he's awake for a certain period of time. I look up at the sleep cue and then we put him in bed. Oh, and putting him in bed is um, another thing that you need to think about. You have to make the room dark. I'll explain why later, but have a dark room. I don't necessarily have a blackout blind in my room per se. However, it does darken the room. So I draw all the curtains and then I put him to sleep in the room with a white noise machine. I'll explain that later also. When I follow all of these patterns, he falls asleep within a few minutes of putting him in his cot. Bedtime is slightly different from that time. With bedtime, because that's a longer sleep that they need for the night and we need to train their body clock also. So you need to follow a certain bedtime routine. You need to set up a certain bedtime routine. It's not necessarily follow something that someone else has done. You do whatever you want to do, but make sure it's consistent. Make sure you follow the same routine every day so babies are aware and they know the difference between a short nap and a long bedtime. With naps, he fell asleep easily, but with bedtime, Levi didn't fall asleep easily. We did everything that we did during the day and we had our bedtime routine but when we put him to sleep he was getting agitated and he was crying because he kind of wasn't used to it at all. So we were going to do the Faber method. The Faber method is where you let the baby cry or fuss it out for three minutes and then you go in and check on him. Do not pick him up but comfort him, pat him, put a firm hand on his belly and comfort him, let him know that you're there and he can go to sleep and maybe kiss him if you wanted to and then come out and then go back in after five minutes and then 10 minutes and then 12 minutes, you kind of stretch the time. They are not crying it out completely, but they are crying. When we decided to do this, we were going to cap the time with Faber method. I think you don't really cap the time and even with the extinction method, which is cry out method, you don't cap it at all. They just cry and cry and cry until they tire themselves out and then they go to sleep and then eventually they get used to it after a couple of days. We wanted to cap it off at 30 minutes. We didn't want to leave it any longer at all. And he wasn't even crying the first day that we did it. He was only fussing about. He was kind of, you know, trying to move and fuss because it was all new to him. So when he was fussing about, we went in three minutes, five minutes, 10 minutes, and then we stopped. We just picked him up at the end of that half an hour. We were like, okay, um, we don't know when this is going to stop. We didn't want it to continue for too long. We picked him up. But the minute we picked him up, he was fine with it. He was calm. He was comforted. And then he became calm. He didn't fall asleep. He became calm though. And then we put him in his cot and he promptly fell asleep after that. We had to do that for two or three days. I don't really remember now, but it was only two or three days, not longer. But from the fourth day onwards, he just fell asleep on his own. At the time of doing this, we thought we were creating our own method. We were picking and choosing a few things from different methods. But then when I continued doing some research, I recently found out that the style that we are doing, the method that we are doing is called the baby whisperer. So you put them to sleep. If they are agitated, fussy or crying, you pick them up, comfort them, put them back down again. And then if they do that again, pick them up put them back, pick them up, put them back. So yeah, that's what we do basically. And in the last week when he wasn't settling, when you look at your child crying, you know whether he is crying um, out of hunger, out of stress, or he is overtired, or he's just undertired. You know the difference when you look at them. So we'll be sitting outside his room watching in his monitor. And then when we know that he's overtired and he cannot fall asleep, we just go and pick him up and help him to sleep. That's it. You know he's tired, there's no point letting him cry even longer and extending the night. Just go and comfort him and put him down. Routines are so important for babies. Babies thrive on routine. They need to know what's going to happen next and they need consistency. Sometimes we think babies don't know or don't remember, but that's not right at all. I love a good routine. So this is something that I'm really, really interested in and I'm very happy with the routine that we have at the moment. With our bedtime routine, we do bath, lotion, put on a pajama, read a book to him, and then pray and sing a song while taking him to his dark room, switch on the noise machine, kiss him goodnight, 
and leave. It's always me who gives him a bath and it's always Lakshman who puts on the lotion for him. So we've kind of split the work between the two of us and Levi knows that also. So once he dresses up in his pyjama, he then comes out to the living room. We sit and read a book. At the moment, I'm reading the 365 days Bible to him. When he is older, we'll probably do some other reading, but this is what we're doing at the moment. And then we pray to end the day and I sing to him while I'm walking him to the bedroom. It's not like a full song or anything, just some sort of a calm song to calm him down for the night. The room is already ready for him. The curtains are drawn, the blinds are drawn, and I put him in his bed, switch on the noise mission for him, and then kiss him goodnight, and I leave. That's it. It doesn't have to be a very long routine at all. It can be anywhere between 15 to 20 minutes. Our routine is about 15 minutes, sometimes 18 minutes not more than that at all. Bath always calms babies down at night. It helps them relax and it also helps them burn out the last bit of energy that they have. And the minute we take him down to his changing station to put on his lotion and uh, pajamas, he calms down completely. He knows what's coming next. It's just important to keep the bedtime routine as calm as possible. We switch off the TV, we switch off radio, all of the lights. You wouldn't want to be playing heavy metal music or even letting the TV on in a loud volume. Otherwise, you're just going to distract the baby and stimulate him. He's not going to be ready for bed at all. He would want to continue playing after that. Here are some of the tips that I've learned along the way. White noise is a godsend. It is such a good thing. You know, my mother even joked about it and she hated it in the beginning. She was with us when Levi was born to come and help us out, you know. So when she was trying to put him to sleep, she didn't want to use a noise machine at all. But a few days later, she soon learned that it was important and she was looking for it every time she needed to put him to sleep. White noise mimics the sound in the womb. The womb is not quiet at all. If you were under the impression that they really need a quiet environment to sleep, that's not true. They need a lot of noise and they need something that mimics the womb and that's what the white noise does. And it also drowns out all the other noise in the house and avoids any distraction for the baby. Do not underestimate the power of the dark room. I've trialed both and trust me when I tell you, the dark room actually works. The first time when we put him to sleep on his own, I darkened the room. My blinds is not even a blackout blinds and neither are my curtains blackout curtains. But it is dark in there when I draw the blinds and the curtains. So I did that a few times and he fell asleep within a few minutes. And then one day I wanted a trial not having the windows down, you know. Um, not having the curtains down because I read some conflicting information. Someone said that naps should be loud bright, noisy, and bedtime should be dark. Otherwise, babies are not going to know the difference between day and night. So I trialed it. I left the curtains open and I put him to sleep with this white noise. Everything else was the same. And this was only for his nap. But he didn't sleep at all. He got agitated. He was trying to move about and he just got agitated and he was awake. In the end, I had to go and close the blinds and the curtains and I pick him up and comfort him and put him down again and then he fell asleep immediately. A bright room is another distraction. When it's bright, they're looking around at everything. They are getting distracted and they're getting overstimulated. They're not able to rest. That's why it's important to have the room dark when you want your babies to sleep, whether it's day or whether it's night. Following baby cues is another thing that is so important. I was so ignorant about this. I don't even remember seeing him yawn or, no, I, I remember seeing him yawn, but I don't remember counting the timing and I don't remember watching him rub his eyes or, you know, scratch his ear or pull his hair or, you know, any of those other cues. I wasn't even aware of any of those cues until I started looking for it. But when you follow those cues and you follow the wake time, it really helps you set them right for their naps and their bedtime. And the final one is sleep begets sleep. This is somewhat a myth. You can't allow your baby to sleep too much during the day. If you do that, they're not going to sleep enough at night at all. They need about 20 hours, 15 hours, 16 hours. Um, how much sleep they need differs according to their age. At the moment, Levi needs about 15 hours of sleep, 14 to 15 hours on average. If I let him sleep for 5-6 hours during the day without capping his nap, he's not going to sleep well at night at all. So the most you can allow them to sleep for one nap window is two hours. You need to wake them up within two hours and then let them sleep again after the next nap. There are many charts available online that 
suggests a list of average sleep that a baby needs according to its age. And there are some Facebook groups as well. Uh, this one particular Facebook group that I'm part of is really, really good. It's called Respectful Sleep Training and Learning. And they've got many files in there with a lot of information that you can go and read. All of them are science-based and all of them are researched. Um, I think they have their citations and everything on there, but you can go and see all of those details. You are the best mother your baby can ever have. I needed to hear this multiple times and I'm sure I will need to hear this a lot more times in the future as well. No one else can take care of your baby as best as you can and no one else knows your baby as best as you can. Be it your friends, your family, be it anyone with a lot of experience with your multiple children, it's never the same. No two babies are the same, even siblings are not the same. I've had cousins and families who have multiple children and no two of their children are the same at all. If their children are not the same, how can you expect your child to be the exact same as your cousins or your nieces or your nephews? It's not the same. People can share their experience and their advice, but it's up to you to see what you want to take and to see what works for you. Just remember this every single day. You are the best mother you can ever be for your baby.